Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. The Chief Minister of Rajasthan will dedicate the UNESCO World Heritage Certificate for Jaipur. See, in 2019, the pink city of Jaipur was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it became the 38th World Heritage Site from India to be listed under the World Heritage Program of UNESCO. Under the World Heritage Program, UNESCO recognizes unique landmarks, areas and sites from around the world for their cultural and natural heritage and provides them with international protection. Under this program, the World Heritage Sites are recognized under three different categories. This includes cultural, natural and mixed. Sites which have a rich cultural, historical and architectural heritage are recognized under the cultural category. Sites which have a rich natural heritage and rich biodiversity, they are recognized under the natural category. And those sites which display a mix of both cultural and natural heritage are recognized under the mixed category. This program of UNESCO is administered by the World Heritage Committee of UNESCO according to the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage. This convention was adopted by UNESCO in 1972 and it came into effect from 1975 onwards. Under this program, a member country of UNESCO first nominates its heritage sites either under the natural or cultural category. After nomination, these sites are evaluated for their cultural and natural heritage by the International Council on Monuments and Sites and the World Conservation Union. After evaluating the nominated sites, the International Council on Monument and Sites and the World Conservation Union, they submit their advice to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. Based on this advice, the UNESCO World Heritage Committee will finally decide whether the nominated site should be provided with the tag of UNESCO World Heritage Site. This prestigious tag will be provided if the nominated site meets the criteria prescribed by the World Heritage Committee. Once listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, they receive protection under international law because protecting such sites of cultural and natural significance is considered to be in the collective interest of humanity. India being a country with rich cultural and natural heritage has got 38 sites listed under the UNESCO World Heritage Program and the pink city of Jaipur is the latest listing from India. Out of these total 38 World Heritage Sites in India, 30 of them are Cultural World Heritage Sites. Some of the latest sites to be listed under the cultural category include the Pink City of Jaipur, it was listed in 2019. Then we have the Victorian Architecture and Gothic Architecture of Mumbai, it was listed in 2018. Then we have the Walled City of Ahmedabad, which was listed in 2017. The architectural work of Lake Corbusier in Chandigarh was listed in 2016 and Rani Ki Wav in Gujarat was listed in 2014. Then there are seven natural world heritage sites in India. This includes the Great Himalayan National Park Conservation Area, the Kaziranga National Park, Kyoldio National Park, Manas Wildlife Sanctuary, Nanda Devi and Valley of Flowers National Park, Sundarbans National Park and Western Ghats. And there is only one UNESCO World Heritage Site in India which falls under the mixed category. This is the Kaziranga National Park of Sikkim which was listed in 2016. It has been recognized by UNESCO for both its cultural significance and as well as its natural significance. The pink city of Jaipur has become the latest addition from India to the UNESCO World Heritage List. This historic city was founded in 1727 by Savai Jai Singh II, who was the Kachwaha Rajput ruler of Amer. The city has been designed and built according to a grid plan inspired by Vedic architecture. While evaluating the nomination of Jaipur, the International Council on Monuments and Sites has recognized the unique cultural heritage and the architectural heritage that is found within the walled city of Jaipur. The International Council on Monuments and Sites has recognized the uniqueness of grid plan based architecture. 
it has recognized the buildings with pink facade that are unique to Jaipur. It has taken note of the uniform architecture of the streets and the large public squares that are designed, which are locally known as choppers. And the uniform facades of markets, residential buildings and temples found within the walled city of Jaipur had impressed the evaluators from the International Council on Monuments and Sites. So in order to complete the formal process, the Chief Minister of Rajasthan, along with the Director General of UNESCO, will be presenting the UNESCO World Heritage Certificate to the city of Jaipur. Now let us take up a column from page number 10, which evaluates the recommendations made by the 15th Finance Commission in its interim report for 2020-21. See, Article 280 of the Indian Constitution provides for a Finance Commission to decide upon the devolution of funds from the centre to the states. This commission is constituted by the President of India and it consists of a chairman and four members who are appointed by the President. According to Article 280, the primary function of the Finance Commission is to provide for the devolution of funds between the centre and the states from the divisible pool of taxes. See, from the taxes that are collected by the government, a part of it belongs to the divisible pool of taxes which has to be divided between the centre and the states. So the responsibility of the Finance Commission is to work out a formula based on which these funds can be devolved from the centre to the states. This formula of the Finance Commission provides for two types of devolution. One is vertical devolution and second is horizontal devolution. See, vertical devolution of funds refers to the devolution of funds between the centre and the states and horizontal devolution of funds refers to the devolution of funds amongst the states. So vertical devolution is nothing but the percentage of funds from the divisible pool of taxes that has to be transferred by the centre to the states. See, for example, the 14th Finance Commission had recommended that 42% of the divisible pool of taxes has to be devolved from the centre to the states. So according to this formula of vertical devolution, the centre devolves 42% of the funds from the divisible pool of taxes to the state governments. But this does not mean all the states get equal allocation. States are given different allocation based on a certain set of criteria. And this allocation that is done amongst the states is referred to as horizontal devolution. Next, the Finance Commission is also responsible for determining the grants in aid that has to be provided to the state governments. It also makes recommendations to the President to augment the funds of a state and to supplement the resources of panchayats and municipalities in the state on the basis of the recommendations made by the State Finance Commission. Apart from this, the Finance Commission also takes up any other matter referred to it by the President as a part of its terms of reference. Then coming to the term of the Finance Commission, I told you that the Finance Commission is constituted once in every five years by the President according to Article 280. But this term of the Finance Commission can be extended based on political and economic circumstances. Essentially, the term of the Finance Commission can be extended due to political and economic circumstances. But at the end of this term, the President has to appoint the next Finance Commission. So the 15th Finance Commission was constituted by the President in 2017 and it was supposed to submit its final report by the end of 2019. And these recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission was supposed to be in effect from 2020 to 2025. But due to unavoidable political and economic developments, the work of the Finance Commission got delayed and as a result, the 15th Finance Commission was not able to submit its final report in 2019. Due to the reorganization of Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories, due to the economic slowdown and the subsequent lower collection of taxes, and due to the GST compensation dispute between the centre and the states, the work of the Finance Commission got delayed and it sought an extension from the President. So accordingly, the term of the 15th Finance Commission was extended and it was asked to submit an interim report 
for the financial year 2020-21. And by the end of 2020, it will be submitting its final report, which will come into effect for the period 2021-2026. to This interim report was recently tabled in the parliament by the finance minister while she was presenting the union budget. And this column evaluates the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission that has been made in the interim report. First, the writer evaluates the approach that has been taken by the 15th Finance Commission. According to the writer, the 15th Finance Commission has more or less followed the same approach and methodology that was followed by the previous Finance Commissions. Accordingly, the 15th Finance Commission has estimated the revenue and the expenditure of the central and the state governments. And the 15th Finance Commission has followed the vertical devolution formula that was developed by the 14th Finance Commission for deciding upon the devolution of funds to states from the divisible pool of taxes and for deciding upon the revenue deficit grants that has to be provided by the centre to the states. But while following the vertical devolution formula of the 14th Finance Commission, the 15th Finance Commission has made a small change by keeping in mind the major political developments that took place in 2019. See, as far as vertical devolution is concerned, the 14th Finance Commission had said that 42% of the funds that are collected in the divisible pool of taxes should be devolved to the states. But this recommendation had been made earlier by the 14th Finance Commission by taking into account that India had 29 states. But in 2019, the state of Jammu and Kashmir was reorganized into two union territories and the 15th Finance Commission had to take this into account. So now, India had 28 states and two new union territories. And by keeping this in mind, the 15th Finance Commission has made a small change to the vertical devolution formula that was developed by the 14th Finance Commission. Instead of devolving 42% of the funds, the 15th Finance Commission has recommended a devolution of 41% of the funds from the divisible pool of taxes. Now let us talk about the controversy surrounding horizontal devolution and how the 15th Finance Commission has tried to address the concerns of the state governments. See, for calculating horizontal devolution of funds amongst the states, the Finance Commission makes use of a certain set of parameters. This includes income distance, population, area, forest cover, etc. See, for calculating income distance, the state with the highest per capita income, that is Goa, is taken as a reference. And the per capita income of the concerned state is measured against the per capita income of Goa. So if the income distance between the per capita income of Goa and the per capita income of the concerned state is greater, then the concerned state gets a higher allocation of funds. And if the income distance between the per capita income of Goa and the per capita income of the concerned state is lower, then the concerned state is given a lower allocation of funds. Because if the income distance is higher, it means that the concerned state is lagging behind in development. So in order to assist its development, additional funds are given by the 15th Finance Commission. Then coming to population, states with higher population get higher allocation of funds, states with larger areas get higher allocation of funds, states with more forest cover get a higher allocation of funds. And recently, two additional parameters have been added which is demographic performance and tax effort. Demographic performance recognizes those states which are reducing their fertility rates by investing in population control mechanisms. So basically, demographic performance is inversely proportional to a state's fertility rate. If a state is bringing down its fertility rate through population control measures, then its demographic performance improves and it gets a higher allocation of funds as a recognition of its population control efforts. Then tax efforts recognizes those states which are generating more tax revenue through economic development. But when the 15th Finance Commission was constituted in 2017, a major controversy broke out over its terms of reference that were given by the President. Because the terms of reference of the 15th Finance Commission 
introduced a new change to the population parameter. The 15th Finance Commission was asked to consider the population data of both the 1971 census and the 2011 census. This terms of reference was interpreted by the southern states as an effort of the central government to subsidize the high population North Indian states. As we discussed earlier, if population and area of a state is higher, they get a higher allocation. So as a result, South Indian states, which are smaller in area, which have low population and high economic growth, they end up receiving lower allocations by the Finance Commission as compared to the North Indian states, which are bigger in area, which have higher population and which have low economic growth. The argument made by the South Indian states was that they are not only smaller in area and they not only have lower population as compared to the North Indian states, but they have also made considerable efforts to decrease the fertility rate by investing in economic growth. So their argument was that instead of being recognized for their demographic performance and tax effort, they are being punished and they are being forced to subsidize the North Indian states which have not reduced the fertility rate and which have not improved their economies. See, this concern of the South Indian states comes up because of the different weightage that is given to these parameters while calculating horizontal devolution. If you look at the recommendations of the 14th Finance Commission, it had given a weightage of 50% for income distance, a high weightage of 17.5% for population, a weightage of 15% for area, and a low weightage of 7.5% for forest cover. And demographic performance had been given a weightage of only 10% by the 14th Finance Commission. So the 15th Finance Commission has made considerable changes to the weightage given to these parameters of horizontal devolution in order to address the concerns of the state governments. It has reduced the weightage given to income distance to 45% from 50%. More importantly, it has reduced the weightage given to population to 15% from the earlier 17.5%. It has retained the same weightage for area, but it has increased the weightage given to forest cover. And again, it has made an important change to the weightage given to demographic performance. Instead of 10%, it has given 12.5% weightage for demographic performance. This means that the 15th Finance Commission has given better recognition for those states which have brought down their fertility rates through population control measures and economic development. And the 15th Finance Commission has also given a weightage of 2.5% for tax effort in order to recognize the contribution of state governments to generating tax revenue. So these are the changes that have been made by the 15th Finance Commission in order to satisfy and address the concerns of the state governments, especially the South Indian states. So based on this new formula, or horizontal devolution has been worked out by the 15th Finance Commission. And if you look at the final allocation of funds, the biggest hit has been taken by these states. Karnataka has come out as the biggest loser by registering a significant cut in its allocation. Karnataka is followed by Uttar Pradesh, Kerala, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. The lower allocation to these states is an outcome of their performance with regard to these parameters. But South Indian states have expressed their displeasure because even after making changes to the weightage given to these parameters in horizontal devolution, they have still received a major cut in their allocation of funds. Then according to its mandate, the 15th Finance Commission has also provided recommendations with regard to local grants. That is the grants that are provided to panchayats and municipal bodies. The 15th Finance Commission has recommended a devolution of around 90,000 crore rupees for panchayats and municipal bodies. Out of this amount, around 60,000 crore rupees has been allocated for panchayats and another 30,000 crore rupees for municipal bodies. A key highlight of this allocation is that the 15th Finance Commission has ensured that all the three tiers of panchayat get a share out of this allocation. This includes the Zilla Panchayat, the Tehsil or the Taluk Panchayat, and the Gram Panchayat. And out of these funds, 50% of the grants for the Panchayats have been tied to the performance of the Panchayats with regard to improving sanitation and drinking water facilities. 
So panchayats which show better performance in sanitation and drinking water, they will receive a higher allocation. Then as a part of its additional responsibilities, the Finance Commission had been asked to decide upon the devolution of funds for disaster management. The 15th Finance Commission has recommended a budget of around 28,000 crore rupees for the National Disaster Response Fund and the State Disaster Response Funds. These funds have been established by the Disaster Management Act of 2005. And out of these 28,000 crore rupees, the 15th Finance Commission has said around 22,000 crore would be contributed by the central government. But the most important recommendation of the 15th Finance Commission with regard to disaster management is that it has directed the centre and the state governments to establish the National Disaster Mitigation Fund and the State Disaster Mitigation Fund as mandated by the Disaster Management Act. See, under the Disaster Management Act, two types of funds have been constituted. The Disaster Management Act provides for a National Disaster Response Fund and State Disaster Response Funds in order to provide for immediate relief in the aftermath of a disaster. These two funds have already been set up by the central government and the state governments. The Disaster Management Act also mandates the establishment of the National Disaster Mitigation Fund and the State Disaster Mitigation Fund in order to sponsor the mitigation efforts in the preparedness phase that is in the pre-disaster phase. But the central government and the state governments are yet to set up the National Disaster Mitigation Fund and the State Disaster Mitigation Funds. And finally, the 15th Finance Commission has also recommended a few sectoral grants for priority areas such as nutrition, especially for children in the age group of 0 to 6 years and lactating mothers. It has recommended a dedicated grant for police training, modernization and police housing as a part of police reforms. It has made dedicated grants for railway projects, for the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. It has allotted funds for strengthening the judicial system as a part of judicial reforms and it has also made allocations for improving the statistical system of India. But the writer says that these efforts of the 15th Finance Commission will succeed only if the central government manages to achieve convergence between various central sector schemes and centrally sponsored schemes. Now let us take up another column from page number 10 which evaluates India's lack of influence at the International Maritime Organization and how this affects India's national interests. See the IMO is a specialized agency of the United Nations. It is headquartered in London and it is responsible for regulating every aspect of global shipping. Recently the IMO has banned ships from using fuel which has a sulphur content greater than 0.5%. This notification of IMO has come into effect from the 1st of Jan 2020. The International Maritime Organization is also making efforts to reduce the emissions of nitrous oxides and ozone depleting substances from the shipping industry in order to reduce its contribution to climate change and protect coastal environment. In fact, the IMO has even drawn up a long-term strategy to decarbonize the shipping industry in order to reduce its carbon emissions. These regulations are similar to the emission standards that governments impose on cars and bikes and it comes with the same set of concerns. If you have to adapt to these standards, then a country needs to invest in improving the quality of its oil refining. Oil refining has to be improved in order to reduce sulphur content and the content of nitrogen oxides. And in order to adapt to the higher quality fuel, the engine has to be made compatible and this translates to significant increases in operational costs for the shipping industry. And if the operational cost for the shipping industry goes up, then it will have a direct impact on the cost of imports and exports. So for a country like India, these regulations of the IMO is bound to have a direct impact on its national interests. But despite that, the Indian government hardly exercises any influence at the International Maritime Organization. The writers say that India has a negligible presence at the IMO and its failure to intervene in the decision-making process of the IMO 
is having a direct impact on India's national interests. See, the headquarters of IMO is located in London. All prominent maritime nations have a dedicated permanent representative stationed in London in order to lobby with the IMO. For example, if you look at the European Union, they have permanent representatives at London who interact with IMO. And these representatives, they represent the collective interests of the European Union. Similarly, the East Asian countries such as China, Japan, South Korea, etc. They also collectively exercise their influence at the IMO. Apart from acting collectively in order to secure their interests, these countries also have dedicated permanent representatives who represent the interests of the respective countries. But on the other hand, despite being a prominent maritime nation, India has not had a permanent representative at the IMO office in London for the last 25 years. The writers say that the Indian government, that is the Ministry of External Affairs, has largely neglected the International Maritime Organization. And this lack of intervention is having a direct impact on India's national interests. Next, on page number 11, we have a column related to the Sagar Doctrine of India and India's maritime policy and foreign policy doctrine towards the Indian Ocean region. But we have already had an elaborate discussion on this topic just a couple of days ago. So kindly go back and watch the analysis for the 3rd of Feb and go through this article once. Next, on the same page, we have another column related to disaster management. See, recently, the government of India has proposed to amend the Disaster Management Act of 2005. This proposal to amend the act is mainly focused upon improving preparedness, improving our relief measures and taking up initiatives to protect infrastructure during the times of disaster. But the editorial says that the proposed amendment neglects long-term recovery, which is very much needed to promote long-term reconstruction and rehabilitation. See, the Disaster Management Act of 2005 was a revolutionary step which established a disaster management framework in India. It laid down the architecture for disaster management. It established institutions such as the National Disaster Management Authority, SDMA, DDMAs, etc. It established a dedicated force known as the National Disaster Response Force and the State Disaster Response Force as well. It even provided for the establishment of dedicated funds such as the National Disaster Response Fund and the State Disaster Response Fund. And as we discussed earlier, it has also recommended the establishment of the National Disaster Mitigation Fund and the State Disaster Mitigation Fund. Even though the mitigation fund is yet to be established, the other institutions have functioned remarkably well over the years and they have played a key role in bringing down the impact of a disaster. See, the need for such a Disaster Management Act was felt in 2004-2005 in the aftermath of three major disasters that India had recently suffered. One was the super cyclone which devastated Odisha in 1999. The other one was the Buj earthquake in Gujarat which occurred in 2001. And then we had the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004. All these mega disasters caused significant damage to life and property and they highlighted India's vulnerability to natural disasters. So in the backdrop of these disasters, the need was felt to establish a disaster management architecture which could comprehensively cover all the areas of disaster management. So this is what the Disaster Management Act managed to do and it provided for the division of disaster management into three different phases. That is pre-disaster phase, during disaster phase and post-disaster phase. In the pre-disaster phase, the Disaster Management Act gives a very high priority for preparedness and mitigation initiatives. And during the disaster phase, the legislation gives a very high priority for immediate relief and rescue. But unfortunately, the post-disaster phase, which includes compensation, rehabilitation, reconstruction and long-term recovery, has been largely neglected. The writers say that Provisions related to post-disaster are very inconsistent in the current Disaster Management Act and hence they are requesting the government 
to consider giving greater priority to long term recovery in the proposed amendment to the disaster management act because the amendment that has been proposed again gives focus only to preparedness relief and protecting infrastructure but it has again neglected long term recovery now let us take up the practice questions which of the following statements are correct during elections the election commission of india exercises control and superintendence over government officials it can transfer appoint and discipline officials as they are deemed to be on deputation to the election commission during elections these powers of the election commission are drawn from the model code of conduct amongst the given statements the first and the second statement are correct but the third statement is incorrect these powers of the election commission are drawn from section 28a of the representation of people act of 1951 not from the model code of conduct so option b is the right answer this question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 3 according to which the election commission of india has appointed a new dcp for southeast delhi now let us take up the second practice question which of the following statements are correct the chief justice of india functions as both the judicial head and as well as the administrative head of the supreme court as the administrative head he is responsible for appointment of court officials and general and miscellaneous matters relating to the supervision and functioning of the supreme court both the statements are correct option c is the right answer this question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 9 according to this article a bench of the supreme court has said that the chief justice of india has to take a final call on the live streaming of important cases because the chief justice of india is the administrative head of the supreme court now let us take up the third practice question with regard to india's relations with malaysia the import of which item has been a source of dispute recently the correct answer is option c palm oil this question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 13 Pakistan is looking to buy more Malaysian palm oil. See Malaysia is one of the world's largest producers of palm oil and India has been one of the largest importers of palm oil. So until recently India was one of the major importers of Malaysian palm oil and this was a major source of revenue for the Malaysian government. But recently Malaysia has taken a few controversial foreign policy decisions. which go against india's interests malaysia has joined the ranks of pakistan and turkey and it has targeted india's policies in jammu and kashmir malaysia has supported pakistan in bringing up the matter at the organization of islamic conference and malaysia has even criticized india's citizenship amendment act and the controversy surrounding npr and nrc india considers these issues as internal matters of india and hence the policy decisions of malaysia has been opposed by india so in response to these decisions of malaysia india decided to cut down the import of palm oil from malaysia that's the reason why this topic has been in news and in order to fill the gap created by the cutting down of indian imports pakistan has promised to buy more malaysian palm oil now let us take up the fourth practice question which of the following statements are correct an epidemic refers to a sudden increase in the number of cases of a disease more than what's typically expected for the population in that area this statement is correct because an epidemic refers to the sudden break out of a new disease or a sudden increase in the occurrence of an existing disease so if there is an unexpected break out of a particular disease in a given area then it is referred to as an epidemic the second statement says a pandemic disease refers to an epidemic that has spread over several countries or continents affecting a large number of people this statement is also correct a pandemic basically refers to an epidemic which has spread over multiple countries and has affected multiple people the third statement says global pandemics are declared by the united nations this statement is incorrect because pandemics are declared by the world health organization So option B is the right answer one and two only this question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 14 the world health organization 
has refused to declare novel coronavirus as a pandemic as of now. Now let us take up a map-based question. Recently, the Environment Ministry granted permission for survey and exploration of uranium in which tiger reserve? The correct answer is option B, the Amrabad Tiger Reserve, which is located in Telangana. This permission was granted in 2019. This question has been asked because the Hindu carries an image on page number 8, which refers to a forest fire in the Amrabad Tiger Reserve of Telangana. Now let us take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper. Doctors Without Borders or Medicine Sans Frontiers or MSF, often in news, is a non-governmental international organization. Option B is the right answer. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, evaluate the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission for 2020-21. The second question, India's negligible presence and interventions in the International Maritime Organization is affecting its interests. Critically discuss. So kindly write an answer to these questions and post them in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.